Today's Bible reading has been taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. The Parable of the Lost Sheep Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The Parable of the Lost Coin Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thank you, Nandita, for uh, reading our, our Bible passage today. And um, Tiara, that was just awesome. Thank you so much. I think your songs were just uh, beautifully spoke to today's topic of lost and found. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's great to have you join us today in our worship. And um, so before I begin, I'm just going to get to uh, tell a little story. So this was, I must have been about five years old, maybe just a little bit older, but um, my cousins and I, my uncles and aunts, one evening, it was uh, maybe eight o'clock at night, um, decided to go to Marina Beach. And so we all piled in the car and, you know, there was about two or three cars and we went to the beach. And as many of you might know, Marina Beach is quite um, crowded and it was night so it was dark anyway when we got to the beach um, my cousins and I got out of the car and we saw these little crabs you know I don't know if you've seen these little crabs that scurry around and they dig holes in the sand and we were fascinated so next thing you know the four of us just shoot off into the crowd chasing after these crabs and we had the best time you know just looking for these crabs trying to find them running around in the crowd never realizing that, I don't know, it must have been maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, not more than that. But when we came back to where the adults were, oh boy, did we get into big trouble <laughs> because they thought we were lost. We hadn't told them we were running off. We didn't even think about it. So we took off. And for, I think for them, you know, a few or 20 minutes of heartbeat, like heart stopping in their mouths because they thought we were lost. So there's nothing more terrifying than say for parents when a child gets lost or when we lose something that's of great value to us. Now, some of you who know me know I love rings. You can see I have quite a, quite a bit of a collection. And a couple of years ago, I lost a silver ring. And I remember searching high and low for it. I looked all over the house and I even retraced my steps to the bus stop and was you know, looking on the ground the whole way through and back, hoping I'd find this ring. Now, not particularly because it had monetary value for me, but because um, a close longtime friend had given it to me as a gift and it symbolized the strong friendship and bond we had. I think we've all been in similar situations. And if someone uses an analogy or a similar story to make a point or explain a fundamental truth, I think we'd be able to easily relate to it and therefore quite easily grasp the truth or the point that it was trying to make. And it was no different in Jesus's time. Jesus, the master storyteller, used parables or stories that related to everyday life that his audience would be able to easily relate to and grasp in order to explain fundamental truths, especially about the kingdom of God. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Pauline spoke about the sower and last week, Danny introduced treasures or hidden treasures. This week, we continue 
by looking at two more stories that Jesus used to reveal a fundamental truth about God's kingdom of being lost and found. So I'm just going to share my screen. I do have a PPT. Okay. So who are the lost? Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Tax collectors were the most despised people among the Jews. Okay? They were agents of Rome who preyed on their own people. They were considered thieves, traitors, scoundrels, charlatans, who sold their services to foreign oppressors and made money from the expense of their own people. They were so bad, they were given their own category. Worst of the worst. A sinner, on the other hand, was a real irreligious and non-practicing Jew who was a social outcast. They were considered sinners, especially by the Pharisees, because they didn't follow Jewish religious laws. And they basically included people like prostitutes, gamblers, thieves, and bums. So tax collectors and sinners were the ultimate representation of men and women who deserved nothing but God's judgment. From a religious, cultural, and a social point of view, they were the lowest of the low. Yet they were the ones who gathered around Jesus in droves to hear him. They were the ones who drew near to him, who actively sought him and eagerly listened to what he had to say. Now, if you look up the synonym for here, you get some beautiful alternatives such as learn, get to know, find out, understand. So it was the sinners and tax collects who came to learn, to get to know, find out and understand what Jesus was teaching, his message. In fact, the invitation that Jesus offers right before this verse in Luke 14, 35 is, he who has years to hear, let him hear. And it, is, and it is as of all the tax collectors and sinners had heard Jesus's invitation, were challenged by it and came to hear him. Now, one might ask why? Why did they gather in large multitudes to hear Jesus? What is it about Jesus that attracted people such as tax collectors and sinners? Now, recently someone posted this in our Wellsprings WhatsApp group as a possible explanation. So I'll give you a minute to take a look at that. <laughs> but I don't think that's quite why people follow Jesus. One reason could be the kind of message that Jesus preached. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus says, come to me all who are late, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you imagine the kind of manner to the soul that must have been for people who were basically told they were outcasts, society's pariahs, and worthless? But Luke, however, alludes to more. Now, though Jesus says he seeks to bring sinners to repentance, it was followed by no condemnation. Not once does Jesus actually scold or correct a sinner. And if you look through Luke, you'll see that Jesus never once com comments on the sinner's behavior. Like unlike us, my cousins and me who got into big trouble for running off that day, um, Jesus never once condemns or criticizes or scolds the sinner. There's never any condemnation with him. He never wagged his finger or rebuked him. In fact, it was the exact opposite of what the religious leaders and teachers of the law did. The Pharisees and scribes to whom Jesus was actually responding were religious zealots 
who believed in their own righteousness and would never associate with this low class of people. They considered it a great sin. They believed that contact with common folk, even common Jewish folk, would tarnish their own holiness. They would never dream of sharing a meal with a sinner because to eat with someone was to become one with them. So they blatantly, openly, deliberately, and unashamedly never associated. What a contrast to what Jesus did. He fellowshiped with tax collectors. He welcomed sinners. And he was willing to become one with them. All with no condemnation. All he ever brought was a message of hope. No wonder sinners and outcasts were drawn to Jesus. So contrary to what you might think, here's my first practical challenge for us as individuals and as a church. What about us? Do we hang out with tax collectors and sinners of this world? And I'm not talking about the obvious outcasts. What about for someone who may, for whatever reason, have had an abortion or abandoned their family? Or someone due to financial difficulty stole money or gave a bribe? During this pandemic, do you know anyone who may have given cash under the table or used influence to get drugs, a bed, oxygen, vaccine? Or what about those who don't believe in the same things we believe in? Currently, Australia has a law, um, it's called Voluntary Assisted Death Act. And it's basically euthanasia. And it's quite surprising how many Christians in my own church, in my own connect group, who actually agree with this because they believe that is, as Christians, that is the best way to show God's love, is to help someone who's struggling to die. Now, our church has been giving um, financially to families. You know, there's been a call out to ask, is anyone willing to help um, people who are um, affected by the pandemic? Now, many of them are not of the same socioeconomic status as us. Most of us would maybe not ever associate with them. So what about them? And the list just goes on. So they, are they, like us, also not lost and deserving of Christ's love? Are they not worthy of a hand of friendship, a kind word, a close association, a genuine relationship? Or do we, as one commentator put it, sequester, isolate, segregate, quarantine ourselves in the safe fellowship of saints? Quarantine ourselves in the safe fellowship of saints. But more importantly, would people who we consider as outcasts ever want to draw near to us? Would they ever choose to draw near to me, to us? And if they do sit down, share a meal, a table with us, would they see Jesus or judgment from afar? Now, this is a question I have to ask myself. I know I can't just give this message and walk away and say, oh, yep, done, dusted and put that challenge out to you. And I really have to think of what kind of a person am I? Would I draw people near to me because they see Jesus? And who are the people I'm willing to associate? And it could be very subtle, our judgment, our condemnation. So this is my first challenge to us as individuals and the church. So those who are lost, how are we found? Now the Pharisees and scribes who, who I have to admit were equally lost due to their own pride and self-righteousness and legalistic outlook had come not to hear or listen to Jesus but to condemn and find fault. So they started to murmur. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them as if to say, how could you associate with such people? These people are unclean and not worthy of redemption. 
So Jesus uses two beautiful stories from everyday life to illustrate and teach how valuable every lost soul is and that redemption is for everyone. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said very clearly when he says, son of man has come to seek and save the lost. So Jesus turns around to the Pharisees and scribes and asks, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Now I'm gonna introduce you to my little sheep here. Okay, he's called Butterball and I got him in New Zealand. He's just a little stuffed toy, but I absolutely love this sheep. And I love him so much. I've had him for about 15 years and he actually sits on my bed. Now, a while back uh, when my parents were moving house, my things were in their home and my sister offered to go pack all my things because I was in India. And when I came last year to unpack, guess what? I couldn't find Butterball. I was devastated, you know? I was so upset with my sister thinking she had given him away to the Salvation Army with a lot of my other things. And so I untunted high and low for him. And what a relief, what a joy when I found him that, you know, he was tucked away in a box. And it was late at night, but I didn't care. I was calling my sister to tell him how happy I was that I found. And you know what, this is just a stuffed toy. And I was that elated to find it. So any good shepherd, so you can imagine what the joy of any good shepherd would have been. He goes out after the lost sheep until he finds it. It's as if as soon as the shepherd realizes that one of his sheep is missing, he drops everything, leaves the other 99 in the open country probably exactly where they were grazing, not safely tucked away in their pens and goes frantically looking for that one lost sheep until he finds it. Now, apparently sheep have an instinctive tendency to wander. And if the shepherd did not go out and seek this lost creature, it would not have found its way back to him. So he doesn't stop and doesn't give up until he rescues that which was lost. A beautiful picture of the good shepherd, a passionate, persevering savior who delights in saving the lost. Similarly, the story of the lost coin. Yeah. Well, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, commentators have said different, have different views about what that 10 silver coins represent. In Greek, it's 10 drachmas, which is about a day's uh, wages, each coin. Others suggest that this coin might have been part of the, her dowry and therefore represented her future security as a married woman. While some others suggest that it might have been part of her jewelry, a part of her headband, that she wore signifying her upcoming nuptials. And if this is for the case, then this coin was no ordinary coin. Now, whatever the case may be, it's obvious the silver coin was precious to that woman and losing it sent her, sent her into an absolute frenzy to find it. Now, I have to admit when I lost my ring, I did look through the house, I turned everything inside out but I certainly didn't take a broom and start sweeping the house. And if there had been a power outage and there was no electricity, I certainly wouldn't have you know, put the emergency lamp on or used my phone light. I guess that's the current day equivalent of a lamp and hunted for it. I would have just said, all right, tomorrow morning, I'll take a look for it. But to her, it was so precious. She wouldn't waste any time looking for it. And just like the shepherd, she wouldn't stop until she found it. These two stories powerfully show how precious we are to God and how desperate he is to save the lost. The fact that these two stories illustrate using people who actively seek what is lost 
may well put emphasis on the truth that God does not wait passively for sinners to come to him, but actively seeks them out. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He sought us out when we were struggling, frustrated and confused and saved us. By grace, by sovereign grace, he seeks us and saves us. So my second practical challenge for us as individuals and as a church is, how actively do we seek out those who are lost? Or do we just wait for them to come to us? Do we wait for an opportunity to present itself and then take it? Or do we put ourselves out there and actively seek those who need to hear the good news of the gospel of Christ? As a church, we're outward facing. But do we actively leave the church and engage in activities to seek people outside of the church? Or do we just wait passively for the lost to come to us? Now, when we say thy kingdom come as it is in heaven, we are in fact agreeing to partner with Christ to bring God's kingdom here on earth. So if Jesus actively sought to save the lost, shouldn't we also? I just also want to give a word of encouragement at this point, especially for those who might have family members, friends, wayward children who appear to be lost. You know, you've been praying for them for years. I have friends who are Christians, their families are not saved. I know there are many in our church that way. I'm sure there are parents who are crying out for their children who are still lost. There might be families where brother, sister followed Christ, but now has for whatever reason moved away. And I just want to encourage you saying, take heart, because Jesus never gives up. He perseveres. In fact, I think one of the verses, um, I think it's Mark says, he perseveres because he doesn't want anyone to perish. So I just want to give that word of encouragement. Continue to pray for them because God does not give up on any one of his sheep. So my third point is, what happens when the lost are found? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven or over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. So being found, if you look at the verses carefully, can only happen when one who is lost repents. Jesus says in Mark 2, 17, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And both these stories clearly show that being found can only happen when the sinner who's lost repents. So in fact, some commentators believe that the 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent was actually aimed at the Pharisees and the scribes who trusted in their own righteousness. So did not see the need for repentance and therefore were not truly saved. Jesus used these stories to teach them that they themselves might not be as secure as they thought. In fact, the real point behind these stories show, was to show the Pharisees and scribes how wrong they were for, con for being condemning when they said he, come, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus completely turns it on its head and says, no, you should be rejoicing, not griping. Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost child. And truth be told, it's such a wonderful thing 
that, that there is more rejoicing in heaven, clapping, cheering, high fives being handed around when one sinner repents than 29 who think they don't need to be saved. What grace, what love, what joy. A wonderful picture of elation and jubilation when a sinner repents and is inducted into God's kingdom. Rather poetically put by a pastor, Bill Bryan, when he says, whenever guilt is kissed away by God's grace, the angels go wild. And another uh, point of encouragement that just came to me when I was thinking about this is also that um, this is mainly for those who are, again, praying for family members or are in ministry who have walked with someone in whatever small way to bring them to Christ. It might have been a long journey. You may never know if the person you've been praying for, the person you've been mentoring, the person you've been talking to it might just be a small word it might have been a con uh, small conversation whatever it might be a small seed that was sown now when that person repents and becomes uh, comes to god just picture in your mind the rejoicing that takes place in heaven and you were a part of that and i just want to encourage people to say take heart in that okay think of that when you are talking to someone and thinking oh i'm having no effect or no uh, success or what am I doing here? The joy, the rejoicing in heaven that goes on when a sinner repents. So is that the end of the story? Did Jesus wipe his brow and say, phew, okay, that one's done, on to the next. And what about us, the lost who have been found? Is it the end as in they lived happily ever after the end. By no means, it's just the beginning. So how do we move forward? So just to end, I just want to share very quickly my thoughts on how once we are found and saved, we can move forward. The first one, don't get lost again. As in, once you're saved, you're saved, but don't lose your way. Don't waste this amazing gift of grace that was bought at such a high cost. Remember how much it cost to find you, but also remember what utter unbridled joy and celebration was in heaven when you were found. Don't let it slip from you. Continue to have years to hear and draw near to Christ. Two, grow in Christian maturity. When we repent and are saved, we are filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the workings of the Holy Spirit is to help us grow in our faith and to become more like Christ. So don't remain as children, but grow and mature in Christ. In our last series, we looked at one such way that we could do this, and that was through the fruit of the Spirit. So don't be like the seed that fell on the path or among thorn bushes or where there was little soil, but cultivate and be the good soil in which God's word can grow and bear much fruit. And finally, bear fruit for God's kingdom. In John 15, five, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So as you continue to grow in Christ and abide in him, ensure you're also bearing much fruit for God's kingdom. By grace, you were purchased, but don't let it stop with you. Befriend, pray, help, get actively involved. Actively seek ways and means to take the blessings of salvation you received and pass it on to others. That's what God has called us to do. Amen.